What's up, guys? Josh Payne here from 24-7 Sports. The Social Distance Series continues, and today we're welcoming in kind of a, a new face, a head coach of the North Dakota State Bison, pronounced Bison, not Bison. Matt Entz joins us. Coach, i got a million questions for you, as I'm sure you've been asked already, but I want to know first and foremost, like, you're a brand-new head coach, and now yep. you get all this thrown at you. I mean – you're smiling when I asked the question, but I would assume there's not a lot of smiling going on. I mean, how in the world have you guys managed to handle this on your end? Well, we've tried to make, uh, you know, and, and the best decisions possible for the health and safety of our kids. Um, you're right. Being a first year head football coach, there's not a lot of uh, blueprints out there on how to handle a pandemic. And um, so it, we've had to be creative. Uh, right now we probably have about 95% of our football team in Fargo. Uh, there, there's a, a long list of protocols uh, for them to enter the facility. Uh, there's been testing going on um, and, and, and a lot of educating as well. And that's been the biggest thing that we've tried to uh, get to our kids is, is the things that they need to do to continue to stay safe, be healthy. Um, if we want to play a football season, these are the things that need to happen. And uh, just protect their teammates is the biggest thing uh, by trying to make sure they know who they're around, where they're at and, and uh, try to, follow uh, state and regional protocol yeah it's pretty interesting i mean like i don't know if you think in these terms but some people like to think in terms of like their future autobiography and i mean you're right in the portion where you get named head coach at north dakota state and then like 10 minutes later someone says the word coronavirus probably the first you've ever heard about it and then 10 minutes right. after that someone says oh and by the way we got to shut everything down and then who knows how it turns out i mean at the at the very least i guess it's going to be a page turner if you go that route well, you're exactly right. You know, for example, uh, the, the head football coach that I played for in college, he's been a head coach now for about 30 years. And we were visiting and he's like, Matt, you and I have the same experience dealing with pandemic. And that's zero. And so, you know, every day is a new day. That's probably been the biggest piece or that I've had to learn. Uh, probably going back even to the D coordinator days, very type A individual, had to have a plan, need to have everything laid out in front of me. Uh, at this point, point right now, it's it's day to day and, and trying to make sure, just like our players, that, that we make today count. And right now means everything. And we'll worry about tomorrow when we get there. And uh, that's just become part of our process. I told a buddy of mine earlier, I was interviewing Matt Entz. And I, he said, that's the head coach at North Dakota State, right? I said, yeah. And he said, and here was the way that he described your program. Because, I mean, I'm down here in Georgia. So this is the way a boy from Georgia described your program. He said, that's that place that wins all the time and they pump out quarterbacks to the NFL. Right. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's who that is. So it's, I'm kind of interested. You were in the foxhole there and you've been there for quite a while now. You were position yep. coach, you're elevated to head coach. And so, you know, you probably don't talk to many people from South central Georgia about how they feel about your program, but it's gotta be a certain sense of validation to know that coast to coast now, you guys have developed a reputation of winning culture. And it's nice to have that little caveat of, oh, and they produce the most important position in the sport at a very high level. Well, we've been fortunate. And, and uh, you know, I'd have to give a lot of that uh, uh, to Randy Hedberg, our quarterback coach, has been instrumental in, in the development of our quarterback room, uh, our, our two previous drafted quarterbacks, but also the young man we have right now and Trey Lance. Uh, is, is continues to get better throughout the summer. And, and Coach Hedberg's been a huge piece uh, when you talk about all the meetings. Uh, and not only just the X's and O's, but we got good kids walking out of that quarterback room. And so that's always, uh, it's always comforting to know that as a head football coach. But it is fun to see the, the football fans from coast to coast that at least respect how we play football. I know there's always the occasional backhanded compliment that you guys play old school football. And I like to remind people that we play good school football. Uh, you know, we, we, we like to run the football. We like to be efficient in our passing game. And we believe in playing good defense. And, 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 and our special teams has been a huge difference maker for us over the course of the last seven, eight years. And so th that's been our recipe for success. So we're going to continue to use that uh, as long as we can. I think probably the last part of what you said there flies in the face of what typically conventional wisdom would be, because I guess conventional wisdom, which isn't always proper wisdom, would be to look at the fact that you've had Carson Wentz and then you've had Easton there and now you got Trey Lance. And that's a guy I want to talk to you more about in just a second. And you'd figure, oh, those guys must be throwing for a million yards a year. And they put up good numbers. But when you go look at the style of play that you guys incorporate, right. it is very much old school, but not in the backhanded way. It's in the consistently winning sort of way. 
how do you sort of how do you marry those concepts of so we've got star potential at the quarterback position, but there's a way that we do things and we're not changing that? Well, I think the thing that we can and we utilize it in the recruiting process quite often is we play more like an NFL. Our style mimics more NFL football than maybe it does uh, what's in vogue in college football right now. So I think there's some kids out there that kind of, oh, well, you're right. You're under center. You do a lot of different things. Uh, our quarterbacks have to be able to get in and out of plays on the line of scrimmage, get us in the correct protection. And so when you start to elaborate or discuss all the things that we put on the quarterbacks, you know, on his, on him during the course of the game, I, I think it really opens it up to people understand, okay, well, now I understand why it takes the right type of kid to be a quarterback at North Dakota State, but also why their guys are so uber successful as well. I mean, hardcore football fans, guys who watch every level of the sport every Saturday, like myself, we've seen Trey Lance before we know about Trey Lance. The casual football fan probably knows his name from mock drafts and hearing guys yeah. talk about him in terms of future. So pretend I'm one of those guys, and I've heard the name, but I don't really know much about Trey Lance. Who is he as a person? What makes him so special as a player? What's it like to coach him? Well, first off, I'd say he's the most humble young man that, uh, that I've ever experienced or seen at the quarterback position. Now, I say that with a grain of salt because he's learned from some really good ones. And, um, you know, I, I think Easton Stick did as good a job as anyone of getting Trey the tools necessary to be successful here at NDSU. Very thorough. He's a student of the game. Uh, you always hear the term gym rats in basketball. Well, he's, a, he's, a, he's a film room rat. I mean, I just saw him this morning down in our team room watching cut-ups uh, of last season, trying to, get, you know, evaluate himself. Uh, I think the humility piece is critical. Uh, I think anytime you have a, an athlete who's humble, He's willing to learn. He's willing to continue to grow. Um, never once has Trey ever walked in telling anyone that I got it. I understand. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this. Uh, he, he's done a lot this summer to challenge himself, working with some different people, trying to have different experiences uh, so he could push himself. Um, on the football field, extremely steady. You know, he was 19 this last year playing for us. And 19-year-old quarterback, never, fly, never got rattled. Uh, unflappable, has such a great demand or control of our offense, um, has a great uh, control of our huddle, uh, great communicator. And, you know, he, he's a special, special player. You know, the thing that I've been most concerned about over the course of, you know, this extra hype that he's received is he just turned 20 years, 20 years old, probably a little over a month ago. You know, let this young man grow up a little bit before we want to all of a sudden say he's the next best quarterback out there. Um, and he knows that too. Uh, you know, he, he's focused on having an unbelievable 2020 season. And, and that's what I like to hear. I want to shift it to you a little bit. Everyone always has a plan in my world, in the media industry, in your world, in the coaching industry, everyone always has this plan, this vision for where they want to go when they break into the business and yep. 999 times out of a thousand, it doesn't go the route that you thought it was going to go because your plans are, it, your plans are worth what they're worth. But I'm interested from your point of view, I've heard you speak about the fact that you always wanted to be a head coach and it didn't just happen overnight. Like there are these few rare examples of guys who are head coaches by 30 years old and everyone just thinks that's the norm. And clearly that's not the norm. And the progression that your career has taken, how different have things turned out than the way you thought they'd go when you were young and first breaking into this business? Well, of course, I thought I'd be a head football coach. But before, the, before my mid-40s, uh, I thought uh, uh, I would have – But and, and I interviewed for a couple. I had opportunities, uh, you know, at the time, didn't get the job and uh, probably was a, a – was probably the right decision for those institutions. I wasn't ready for it. Um, you know, but I have tried to prepare myself. And when my first, my first job I ever got as a graduate assistant, the, uh, I got interviewed – and they asked me, what do you want to do? And I, I told them I want to be a head football coach. And when I got hired, they told me that's the reason why they – that's really why we're going. Because if you want to be a head football coach, you want to be involved in everything. And so every – whenever I have a, a, a position I need to fill within my staff, that's a question I ask. And what do you want to do or where do you see yourself? And if they hee-haw and don't want to give me that head football answer – then, I, then I, I question if they really are in it for the right reason. I want guys who want to be at the top of their game or 
in leadership roles. And so uh, that's been important to me. But I, I've been around some really great coaches along the way. Uh, I've had great experience. They've allowed me to be involved in multiple facets of the program. And so to say, I've been preparing for 25 years to be a head football coach. And uh, by no means am I an expert at it, but uh, I got a great staff and, and, and great people to, to lean on here as well. I remember when you were introduced and I was listening to your athletic director and I was listening to your university president talk and they were asked, I believe paraphrasing, they were asked, how did you know that Matt Entz was the right guy for the job? And I believe it was your athletic director who said, well, when I presented him the idea and told him I want to talk again in 24 hours, he didn't bring me some 24 hour hastily put together plan. He brought me a plan he had put together over several years. And here's what's interesting. I mean, you guys, if, if, you're, if you're a physician coach or grad assistant even, your hours are already filled throughout the day. And so right. I would imagine you have to be very regimented to not only think razor sharp focus here and now, but also have time to reflect bigger picture, work on where you want to be in 10 years. How do you divvy up your time? How do you block time out? How do you think big picture and right now simultaneously? Well, of course, I think the, the right now piece of it has to take a priority. Uh, you know, the, the, the current team, the current members of your football squad, uh, the, current, the current staff, all that has to be a priority. But what I've tried to do over the course of my career is if it's a, an hour a day, a half hour a day, that's just my time. Maybe, I get, maybe it's reading an article that I thought, you know what, this might give me some insight on something or having a phone conversation with someone or sharing some emails or a Zoom, you know, uh, you know, session with someone, but trying to create some time for me to continue to have not just head coaching development, but personal development. When I was a D coordinator, that hour was spent on understanding other schemes out there maybe, or talking to offensive coaches and trying to identify why are you running those things or what are you looking for in this read or, or in this concept? Well, now as a head coach, I'm trying to find people where I can communicate with how are you running your program and being as efficient as possible? You guys have talked about, and you've talked about in the interview process, wanting to know the future aspirations of any guy you're interviewing. And it's a huge plus when people are thinking like that, when people are thinking yeah. down the road, I want to be a head coach and people throw around the word culture all the time. Everyone thinks that they're about culture, but not everyone's culture is strong. And what stood out to me, even being far removed from North Dakota state, what stood out to me is when a program just keeps on rattling them off and they change head coaches and keep rattling them off and they change quarterbacks and keep rattling them off. You don't have to know anything else about that program to know there's probably a pretty darn good culture in place there. And I've looked at the fact that you guys have been able to continue to promote from within. You've been able to elevate guys to the head coaching position. And it's got to be such a testament to the culture that was in place there before you got there culture that you've contributed to, and now a culture that you're the leader of. Can you speak to me a little bit as someone who hasn't been there, hasn't been around it, how important and how unique the culture is there unto anything else maybe that you've experienced? Well, it, it, I think when I tell people about NDSU, the, the, the asterisk or the comment I always say is you need to come and visit, but yeah, you can't just come for a week and think you're gonna identify what the culture is or what the environment of our football program is. Uh, you gotta come and spend a, a, a large amount of time. It needs to be months, it needs to be a year for you to fully appreciate what it is and how it works. The culture has been around for a number of years. I mean, we, we have three losing seasons since 1965. Uh, this place is extremely pr prideful. Uh, the fans are unbelievably supportive, uh, but they demand a winning program. And that's okay. You, you have to be the right type of person to come here uh, and be successful. We're, we're going we're gonna to play football and we're going to practice football a lot. But um, it, it, you know, my seven years here or six years as a D coordinator were critical in understanding and being able to absorb all the different facets that create Bison football. Um, but I would say the, the, the biggest one, and I know it, it, it's been kind of a, a, a key word out there is servant leadership. And I think that's been around here for a number of years. Uh, we call it bison pride, but that's making sure that you take care of the needs of your teammates before you worry about your own. And when you have a team of 110, 120 guys that are more consumed about what we need to do as a unit and, and what our process is, than they are about the results or the, the pat on the back or the accolade they might receive. 
that's when you start moving things in the right direction. Coach, I work at 24-7 Sports, obviously, so we cover a whole lot of recruiting. And when it comes National Signing Day time, I mean, we're talking about programs that, you know, feature the likes of multi-million dollar recruiting budgets. You're talking about Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, and mm -hmm. talking about maybe jockeying for position with 15 to 24 and five-star rated kids. And I don't think many people are aware of the differences in dynamics of the recruiting structure when you go to maybe a North Dakota state, but yet you guys still get phenomenal athletes and you guys still win and you're pumping guys into the NFL. And I'm very curious for someone who's not familiar, are there any limitations? Are there differences in scholarship structure? How do you cast your recruiting net and your scouting net when it comes time to get ready for an upcoming recruiting cycle? Well, of course, there's there's huge differences between, you know, the power five and, and our level. And, and we consider ourselves a mid-major program. Um, but, you know, I, I think we do a good job of, of eliminating those differences or trying to show people that hey, a winning, winning culture, uh, a great experience is, is going to be what's best for you. Uh, of course, sometimes, you know, people would say our, our location can hinder us a little bit. But uh, I think once we get people in Fargo, it's a community of about a quarter of a million people, uh, people, the stereotype usually dissolves and disappears. Uh, very progressive, you know, it's a new community, it's a new city, one of the top places in the country to start a business. Um, you know, huge edu secondary education's big, the hospital, Microsoft is in town. Um, th th there's a lot of young educated people in, in, in Fargo, um, you know, but, you know, talking about our locate, where we go, uh, of course, we're going to try to dominate the Midwest and we probably butt heads a little bit with some power five schools in the Midwest. We're going to make runs at guys. We we've, we've won occasionally in some of those recruiting battles, not, not often, but occasionally. So that, that keeps us going back. Um, our remote areas, uh, we have four kids from Georgia on the football team. Uh, that's something we've just started in the last year. Gwinnett County, Cobb County uh, is where we're at. And then, of course, the Tampa area and Polk County in Florida, we have 15 kids from that area. But what's most important, regardless of where we're recruiting guys, it's making sure that they're the, before we even start the process, that these young men are the right fit into our program. And, and that means one character football intelligence, academic success. The last thing we look at a lot of times is their athleticism. You know, I, I jokingly tell people this at times, but we're probably not going to win any relay races at North Dakota State, but we're going to win a lot of football games. And so our point is let's go recruit the best football players that we can or the guys that have the highest ceiling as football players that we can. And so what you see us recruit is a lot of multi-sport athletes, a lot of long levered kids, you know, I mean, right now, six, five offensive line, but all of them were probably 240 pounds when they first showed up on campus. Now they're 310. You know, we're, we're going to maybe recruit 160 pound DB that can get to 180, but he's 5'11". You know, he may, he may just not be big enough for, you know, power five, but plenty good enough for where we're at. And the idea that we're a developmental program, you're not going to have, it's hard to come here and play early in your career. You have to be willing to learn, to sit, earn your keep on special teams, and hopefully by year three, you're starting to find some situational time on the football field. I kind of wanted to wrap a bow on this with talking about fighting complacency. Remember, growing up where I've grown up, I, I'm fortunate enough to cover some major programs, and I remember um, listening to Nick Saban talk way back in 2010. They just won their first championship at Alabama. And I remember him saying, in retrospect, we realized that the guys we won the championship with the first time, they had come to Alabama with a, what can I give to Alabama mentality? But then we got some kids in the door and I didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, I realized they were there with a, what can Alabama do for me mentality? You guys have just rattled off championships. And I, that's so abnormal because it's so normal for human nature to let complacency seep in and good enough sort of is enough you got to fight that every day, I would imagine. How do you have structure in place to where not only do the guys who are already there understand we hit the reset button and it's time to go to work for a new season, but when you bring kids in, they're not coming in with any championships under their belt. They have to get it done on their own. Right. I think the, you know, the, the, the term complacency, ego, 
being comfortable, all words that, that we are scared to death of here at NDSU. Uh, I think a couple things that we do, um, we treat every season as a different season. There's no overlap to it. Just because we won last year doesn't mean anything this year. Uh, and so I make a, a heavy emphasis of just making sure every team's different. The, the 2020 team is going to be different than the 2019 and so on and so forth and treating them as themselves. Um, you know, challenging them to continue to get better. I think it goes back to have, recruiting high character kids, make great bison, kids with, with humility, because they still want to continue to get better. Uh, if you bring a lot of guys in that, that feel like, you know, hey, coach, I've made it, I've arrived, well, you're, you're going you're gonna to plateau off. And so we, that's not what we're looking for. And, and so the development process and, and, and how we practice, I think, also um, is extremely successful in helping us continue to grow. But, uh, of course, it, it is always something that, that we're worried about that we, 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 we try to take care of uh, with our leadership uh, every year. And, uh, you know, like I said, those are uh, – that complacency word is something we try to not even, even whisper around here. This has been a pleasure, man. Matt Entz, the head coach at North Dakota State. Coach, I really appreciate you taking a little time out of your schedule to join us, and I really hope that we get to see you guys on a field contending once again this fall. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me on. Yes, sir.